live from the FIA Barcelona Gran Via Conference Center in Barcelona, Spain. It's The Cube at HP Discover Barcelona 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, HP. Welcome back to Barcelona, everybody. This is theCUBE, my name is Dave Vellante, and we're here at uh, HP Discover 2014 in Barcelona. Patrick Osborne is here. Patrick is a CUBE alum, runs the HP backup product business. Patrick, great to see you again. And Frederick Shalal, great to see you. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, Frederick is the head of infrastructure and engineering uh, division at OECD, so welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you today. So, why don't we start with uh, OECD. What's the organization all about and what's your role there? So, the OECD is an international organization, multi-governmental organization based in Paris with uh, 34 member countries. So, we have member countries in almost every continent, like the US and the Canada and the North America. We have Chile in South America, most of the Western countries, and also uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, Japan and South Korea on the East side, so it's a it's a worldwide uh, organization. And your role as head of so I'm the head of the infrastructure division in the IT department. In traffic infrastructure division is looking after server storage, virtualization, network security, everything which is not I would say business related. So the the foundation of the information system. So. So not applications? Not, we, we are managing a few applications, but it's what we are considering core applications like the email system, uh, the databases, collaboration software, yeah. but not product that we are developing for our uh, users. Yeah, so, so, so infrastructure, software, middleware, database, yeah. tools, yeah, that's email, it. you count yeah. as infrastructure, and everything on down. Yep. Okay, big job. I always like to ask practitioners like yourself, what's What's the you know the business driver? What's the what's the where the pressure is coming from? One obvious for you is the global nature of your organization. Maybe you could talk about the the, the drivers in your business. From an First of all, the, the OECD's mission is to uh, promote and recommend economic policies uh, on various subjects. It can go from taxes to health to uh, technology to tractors or fisheries. I mean, we are covering almost every economic domain. And we are not only the 2,500 people working at the OECD are providing this recommendation, but the OECD is also a place, uh, a forum where the governments, it's almost 40,000 uh, international experts that come to Paris to the OECD to discuss about their problems and they try to share experience and find common solutions to the global problems. So we are working a lot with governments, but not only governments, also central banks, international organizations. So we have 34 member countries, but we are collaborating with almost 120 countries around the world. So information access, collaboration, data protection, all big challenges for you So guys. we have different areas of expertise. Of course, we have economists working at the OECD. We have also a lot of statisticians. We are trying to aggregate data that are coming from the national statistical offices and try to compare the numbers and provide a unique set of numbers who can uh, help economists to build uh, the, the new policies. So one of the main challenges that we have we are facing, and we have been facing this challenge for a, a, a while now, is the data growth, data explosion. So we have uh, approximately a 42% data increase every year, uh, which is of course a, a big challenge in terms of capacity management, but not only capacity management, it's also a challenge in terms of uh, uh, making sure this data is secured, is uh, accessed uh, on uh, on a permanent basis. It's backed up in case we, we have a problem and we need to restore it. So it's one of the challenges that uh, uh, we're, we have been facing and trying to improve on a daily basis. All right, Patrick, let's um, let's turn to you. So not an uncommon problem that we're hearing from, from Frederick. High data growth, most of that data I'm sure is unstructured. You've been at the, the files side of Absolutely. things for a while now. You're hitting your groove swing. It's, yep. been, 
several you know years now in this in this job, and your portfolio is starting to round out. So tell us where we're at uh, at Discover. You guys got a bunch of new product announcements in your area. You did the unveiling last night. Um, Always love a good so, unveiling. Okay, good stuff. <laughs> so bring the audience up to date on what you guys are announced, what, what you guys have announced here, and, yep. and where we're at with the products. Yeah, so like we do every Discover, we jam pack it full of innovation, right? Um, that's what we're here for. That's what HP is famous for. Um, and this you know, go around was no different. We had a, a large number of uh, announcements on the primary storage side, which I'm sure you're going to talk to David uh, about later. Uh, in terms of data protection, um, we have uh, some solutions for 3PAR, right? The hottest fastest growing platform from primary storage in the industry, and we get a lot of customers who say, what's the best backup solution for 3 part, right? So, so we decided to go solve that problem and then go even farther, right? So making the, giving the ability to federate primary storage with secondary storage, so the store wants recovery manager central um, product suite that we introduced, uh, we announced yesterday. Um, we talk a lot about um, simplicity in backup, so, um, you know, no one likes backup, right? It's uh, more of a TCO model, right? And um, we try to make it as scalable, as simple, and as efficient as possible. So we really doubled down on store once, federated catalysts, a, a large number of um, expansion in terms of ISV support and different solution areas. Uh, and then, you know, we, uh, to address some of the unstructured data needs, we, um, we came out in two areas with store all, um, integrating with our control point software gives you the ability to take a look at big unstructured data repositories, uh, catalog that application data, uh, do a lot of metadata management, and then you can affect policy on it. And we actually announced a, a tech preview for some very powerful technology in the areas of object storage that we're gonna be releasing uh, in 2015. So a lot of a lot of innovation going on in HP storage. A lot going storage. on, right. So, yeah. uh, and these are all new, new products, yep. right, as of uh, this week. And shipping when? In January. Yep. Everything, yep. that you just all mentioned. Of it. Yeah. All, all, available. Of it. yeah, all available in January. On top of all the great new innovations we have on top of 3PAR and um, in our hyper-converged system. So, a lot going on in HP storage. Okay, uh, Frederick, let me come back to you. Can you just sort of describe your infrastructure and some, some greater detail uh, generally, but since specifically, let's get into the backup piece. Okay, so in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure, we are an organization based in Paris, so we have in Paris two data centers. In terms of hardware, we are almost relying only on HP hardware, so we are using HP Blade systems with uh, Blades to host all our virtualization environment. We are using also HP storage, so we are using HP 3PAR, but also older EVA uh, storage arrays. And uh, to back up this environment, uh, we uh, introduced two years ago the StoreOnce uh, 6200 appliances, StoreOnce appliances, to help us to deal with this huge amount of data that we have to How much up. data? We are talking today about approximately uh, 70 terabytes of data which is not a huge number compared to other organizations sure. that I was able to meet in Barcelona this week. But uh, we, we have a, a real growth in terms of storage because I was mentioning to, to Patrick earlier, in uh, 97, 17 years ago, we had to deal with only three gigabytes of data. And 17 years later, we have 200 times more data than we had in the past. So not only we have a slight increase in terms of uh, servers and storage, but in terms of data, the, the challenge to be able to deal with this uh, uh, amount of data on a day-to-day -day basis from a uh, backup point of view. Well, you'll be over 100 terabytes shortly, so that's... Pro <laughs> probably shortly. Yeah. That's why when we implemented the current storage solution, we had this two terabyte, 200 terabytes uh, uh, on the horizon and we try to implement a scalable solution so that we won't, don't have to come back to our uh, senior managers to ask for more money to be able to back up and back up and back up the data. So how, how long have you been with the organization? A number of years? I've been working for 20 years. Okay, so you, you have the history of the before and after. So I wonder if we could, you, you mentioned you, you brought in the 6200. What was, how were you protecting data before that? What was the backup sort of journey? 
So, so initially, and I said we were backing up a small amount of data, it was huge uh, 15 years ago, but in the end it was not a lot. And we were using standard tools on the market with tapes, essentially we were backing up tape. Uh, and backing up tape is, is the real, uh, I would say, nightmare now, you can say it because uh, the tape is not reliable, takes a lot of time, installs are very difficult. So in 2009, we went from a pure tape backup environment to backup to disk, this disk-based backup, with already HP technology, but we made a lot of mistakes in the implementation. Uh, we were looking only at the technology aspect without looking much detail about scalability, about cost, about security, about high availability. And three years later, in 2012, we had to do a complete review of the backup infrastructure because we had really different requirements and objectives than three years ago. So the main requirement for the new infrastructure that we implemented two years ago were essentially uh, high availability because the data we are backing up to disk needs to be available even if we use a data center because this is a, the main memory of the organization. Uh, it needs to be scalable. We have to cope with the data increase that we are facing on a daily basis. We need to make sure we are able to uh, manage the cost effectively because we cannot afford to pay twice every year in terms of licensing, in terms of storage, in terms of tapes, and in terms of manpower. So we, we need to keep in mind that the storage infrastructure needs to be managed by people. Uh, so we had a different perspective when we implemented this new backup solution. And what we did is in fact purchased two appliances. We put these two appliances in two that different data centers and we have been able to achieve uh, uh, a complete backup of the infrastructure within our backup window without any problem because now we are able to backup the entire infrastructure in approximately 12 hours. Then in the next 12 hours, we replicate the data to the second data center and the next 24 hours are used to duplicate the information from disk to tape. So in this, 48 hours backup window, we have the full cycle and not only we are backing up uh, 70 terabytes of data, but we are duplicating twice the information. So we are managing more than 200 terabytes of data within the weekend with the infrastructure that we put in place. So you, the, you said you, you, if you had to do it over again, you might have done it differently. Uh, you made some mistakes, but, th but it also sounds like it was largely the organizational requirements changed. How much of it was, if I had to do it over again, I would do it differently versus changing requirements that you couldn't predict at the time? Can you talk about that? In fact, when we moved to, uh, fr from the first infrastructure to the second one five years ago, our objective was really focusing on technology, saying we have to go to disks. We don't want to deal with tapes anymore. It's not cost effective. So focusing on technology was our main mistake yeah, okay. because we have to also uh, see this implementation from a completely different perspective, mm -hmm. making sure we are able to manage the cost, manage the, the data growth, and manage the people. So that's why we, we did it differently two years ago. It was not that much an organizational problem. It was, it was more the, the, the focus we put initially on technology where we, we need to shift a little bit the, the focus on, 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 on the people and on the policies. We are an organization where we produce a lot of policies, but we were lacking in, in terms of data policy. The so, so Patrick, growing up in a household, uh, with a head of household as a heavy IT practitioner, you are, I, mean, I talked to your father one time, a couple times, people process technology, technology is the easy part, people in process are always the hard Absolutely. part. Is this a common theme that you hear among customers? So I can remember um, having to go down to the data center uh, at the Travelers, right, when I was about 10 years old, right, because the banks of the heart of the Connecticut River were gonna flood, <laughs> and actually having to remove tapes 
from the data center, right, that hold, you know, basically the general ledger, right, for for the information systems, right, because it's a, a, a basic, you know, disaster scenario, right, so it's real and it impacts people. So some of it's technology, we come out with new technology all the time and try to innovate, um, but really at the end of the day, it's about SLAs, especially for, for backup, right, you want to make that window and those windows are getting more aggressive, you know, every day, we have people who, are classifying more um, applications as mission critical. So given the tools to not only help people assess what their SLAs are and what they should be, um, then providing technology to back that up. And then for backup, it's all it's a lot about cost, right? So um, we try to help customers with ROI studies for store ones and you know and some other interesting financial vehicles like capacity on demand to be able to you know put some more predictability into the infrastructure. Um, and you know the big cost is people, right? So if we can get this down to um, very efficient uh, from a, a cost perspective and an operational efficiency matrix, um, it's really helpful for the customers because backup can be difficult, but you don't want you know someone sitting there and dealing with backups 24 by 7, right? right. You want it more of a function of the infrastructure. So Frederick, how how much virtualization do you have going on in your organization? Virtualization? Yeah, your system's highly virtualized. Yeah, we we started the virtualization journey in 2005, but it yeah. was not progressing very quickly. It was initially essentially uh, about test and development uh, systems, yeah, yeah. and we we changed completely in 2009, and we went aggressively on virtualization. Now we have approximately 83 percent of uh, virtual environment. So how did that affect your backup when you moved so aggressively? To, to, of course, it had a, a, a very uh, high impact on, on backup because it changed completely the way uh, we were uh, backing up all these environments. Uh, I would say it changed the way we are doing backup a little bit initially, but we were still continuing uh, doing backup in the traditional way by putting agents inside the machine and backing up the virtual machine as if it was a virtual machine. And we are moving more and more to a, a, a kind of a snapshot technology where we can take the VM as it is without going into the VM and use the new functionality that are provided by the different players uh, to be able to move back up much more quickly the entire environment and we are very excited about what has been announced so, yesterday. So how do you do it today? Is it a, a weekly full and a daily incremental? That you do? In terms of backup, uh, we are trying to stick with this increme uh, weekly incremental and weekly full as we were doing in the past, but more and more we are moving towards a, a, a full of the time uh, because it will be easier uh, in the future to deal with uh, potential restore operation, especially if we have a main disaster. And you'll be using snapshots as a means of, of doing that? What, what kind of R R RPO and RTO? In parts, fact, you know? right now we have critical ap applications. We have identified through a business impact analysis 10 critical applications where the uh, recovery point objective is about uh, a few minutes and time is recovery time objective is about four four hours maximum uh, for these machines and for these particular applications we are not relying on backup more on replication techniques to make sure information is always available right for other uh, application less critical i would say we heavily rely on backup to be able to restore uh, the information but the rto is more around uh, two, two days, five days. Okay, and then tapes, you use tapes as a last resort off-site? It's really the last resort. Uh, oh, we wait. moved tapes off-site to a different location yeah. in case we have to go back to tapes. It happens from time to time because with in this environment, we have a retention period about to about three months. But sometimes people are coming back to us saying, yo, I had a fly a few years ago, I, I need this fly because it, uh, I need to base my new study on the information that I got uh, stored in this document. So we have to go back to tape from time to time. And you replicate the 6200, data on the 6200 as a, as a uh, 
uh, disaster recovery, but it's synchronous, right? A, a synchronous location? No, no, it's it's asynchronous distance? It's asynchronous. It is, okay. We, we back up and then we replicate. Okay, so you're you're quite a distance, the two data centers. No, no. Quite far apart. And then so the tape is really a very last resort, compliance, you know, uh, hope I never go there. One of the benefits that we've been able to achieve with this last implementation, uh, get away from tapes, to be able to, to focus essentially on, on the disk and with a, a small one's technology. Now how about HP? Obviously you're an HP shop, so you've you're got an affinity for HP, but how has the experience been specific to the, the backup project? From HP, from the standpoint of HP support, the product itself? We had a very, very good experience with HP, specifically on the on the backup side. HP was very interested in our case, uh, in our case study, in our scenario. They helped us a lot in implementing, finding first of all the right architecture and implementing this in relation to the backup software that we are using, because we are not using HP Data Protector. And we have some kind of very special partnership with HP. Uh, which allows us to uh, have a, 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 a communication channel directly to the HP labs. Mm -hmm. So from a, a, an HP and communication perspective, it's, it's a, it was a, a great opportunity. You're not using Data Protector yourself? What's no, your backup, we are not backup using, software. We are, are using another backup software yeah. from a, another vendor. Okay, you don't want to say? Yeah, net backup from Symantec. Yeah, okay. Yes. A lot of people use Symantec. <laughs> <laughs> this is the world we live in, right? Um, Anything you want to see HP work on? What's on their to-do list from their standpoint? Uh, of course, they, we, as we are not using an HP software in conjunction with the, the hardware, we like seeing uh, HP working on, this, on, on the catal HP Catalyst uh, to provide a good uh, interaction with the backup software. That's what they are doing. And they have been announcing yesterday a very cool feature for, uh, in the Simon Tech Terms Accelerator, which uh, is transforming a, a 12 hours backup operation into a few minutes operation. And it's uh, very cool. We have been able to test it. It's very cool. So they need to continue to invest a lot in uh, interacting with uh, uh, software from other vendors. So it's, it's really uh, Critical. Well, you've been with HP a while, so we, we always say with theCUBE, we've been documenting the turnaround of HP. When Meg came in, she said it's going to be a five-year turnaround. We're in year three. From your standpoint, from a customer perspective, how do you feel about where HP is as a company at this point? I think HP is going in the right way. Uh, they are still focusing a lot on what people have right now, their current problems and issues like uh, once again, what have been announced yesterday by David Scott at the keynote, providing more and more functionality to uh, existing hardware or to a platform that we know and we like managing. But at the same time, they have this different perspective in trying to uh, define this new style of IT by changing a little bit, bit the way the companies are operating their IT shop. For us, we are not we really talking anymore about uh, IT. Uh, the IT department is not called anymore the IT department. We are in the uh, digital transformation journey, and I think HP will be a great uh, partner uh, for this journey because uh, we need to focus more and more on the business and less and less on the IT itself. So we are here to provide a service, not not to introduce technology. All right, Patrick, how, how about you? How do you feel these days? Um, yeah, I, some of uh, um, the comments really resounded with me. I, I mean, you know me, I love I love me some technology, right? I love good products and, and, um, and innovation, but if you look around in the, in the conference today, right, you see a different taxonomy here, right? You see things like new style, transformation, business, focusing on business outcomes. So it's definitely, I think that HP has got a really good DNA um, in innovation, especially on the product side with HP Labs and things that have been grown here, things that have come up through acquisition. Um, we've got great technology, but focusing on sort of 
transforming our customers' business. Infrastructure is hard, right? You can't expect someone to go rip and replace all of their products all in one fell swoop. Um, and you know, we don't just sell widgets here, right? So it's about the journey, it's about the transformation, it's about providing the people, the services, the you know, the help along the way from an implementation standpoint. So for me, it's been um, a big transition of very sort of product focused and you know, innovation on the product side to you know, really moving towards better business outcomes for our customers. So that's a good bumper sticker, but I'll, I'll give you the last word, Patrick. So the truck's pulling away from uh, HP. This is the, <laughs> my, my partner, John Furrier, loves this question, but what's it say? The bumper sticker from your perspective, you know, your business, what's, what's the message here? Another 75 years. <laughs> uh, right? Awesome. I mean, I hope I'm here to see it. Yeah. <laughs> you will, you will. As long as you don't go to any more storage parties, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, Frederick and Patrick, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. Yeah, Great thank you very you much, as usual. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We're going to the keynotes next. Uh, should be very interesting. Uh, I think, I'm guessing Martin Fink is today. I don't know if any of you guys know that. Yeah, so, oh, David Scott next? Oh, sorry, we're not ready for the keynotes. Oh, that's right, he's coming a little later. That's why I saw people filing in. My bad. David Scott's coming up next. Always, always exciting, always interesting. We'll get his perspectives, and then we'll go to the keynotes. Keep right there, everybody. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back after this word.